United we're as strong as a mountain. United we're... This is Steve Zeltzer with Workweek. And the, the recent passing of Richard Trumka, the president of the AFL-CIO, has led to a, a lot of articles and statements about what a great, wonderful leader he was for the labor movement in the United States. Uh, not only have union officials said that, but President Biden and a lot of Congress people and, and Democratic Party politicians. And we wanted to get a rank and file view of some of the a, a critical struggle that incur, occurred in the United States in the 1990s, 1995 of uh, the uh, war zone. The strike that took place of three unions who were affiliated with the AFL-CIO in Decatur, Illinois. So joining us is uh, Mike Griffin and Mike Griffin's um, actually uh, uh, from a family of miners. I was born the son of a coal miner and my grandfather was a coal miner as well. So I know what it is to come from the coal mines and, and uh, that story about Trump just starting out in the mines, I don't think that's accurate. But uh, I was a rank and file organizer for the allied industrial workers who later became uh, United Paper Workers through a merger, the EPIA, which was a corporate merger, more or less. And uh, I was involved uh, fairly heavily during the, the three years of the lockout. And uh, I've been involved with the labor movement all my life and, and continue to do so. I can tell you that uh, a lot of us here in Decatur have a different view of Richard Trumka. Well, this struggle that you were in, uh, the, the war zone, the fight of three unions, that took place during a time of uh, a change in the AFL-CIO leadership. With John well, Steve. actually, we were part of that change. Well, why don't the you talk state... about that? Because that's how Trumka came to national prominence in the, you know, with the Sweeney team. Maybe you can talk about that whole struggle indicator, your fight for to protect your unions, the three unions, and, and uh, how the afl -CI was involved in that. Well, when we were first locked out and Caterpillar struck and then Firestone, uh, Lane Kirkland or Lame Kirkland was president of the AFL-CIO. He did not, absolutely nothing to help our struggles. And uh, as a matter of fact, he was actually working against us. As a local, uh, the Staley workers reached out actually worldwide to seek help from other unions and stuff. And uh, many times that, that help was batted down by top leaders of different unions. And uh, when we tried to join and join the AFL-CIO in our fight, uh, they not only resisted, uh, they worked against us. So we knew that uh, Lane Kirkland had to go him and Donahue both. Well, at the same time, after our struggle had been going for better than a year, year and a half, it looked like uh, John Sweeney, head of SEIU uh, International, and Richard Trumpka from the mine workers was uh, interested in running for the positions of secretary treasurer and president of the FLCIO. And uh, they, uh, came on board to some degree with our struggle, uh, wanting to use our local, and they did uh, use us to help them get elected to the, those top positions in the FLCIO. Now, my wife and I were invited down to a labor fel uh, celebration down in Pinckneyville, Illinois, which is one that the mine workers have every year. And while we were there, uh, the regional staff from the United Mine Workers showed up at the table and sat right across from us. And I knew that they were after something. And they wanted us to work on Trumpka's behalf, which we already were, really. And uh, then at different uh, labor functions around the country, I run into Rich and, and uh, you know, he gave verbal support to our, to our struggles at Decatur. Well, we, uh, we got our supporters around the country to, uh, to uh, hold uh, uh, Donahue and, and Kirkland accountable at his regional meetings that he had around the country. And uh, that culminated in Chicago when 
Kirkland uh, tried to say that he was supporting our struggles when we had an audio tape where he was actually said that, you know, we couldn't win, we were losing and a number of things. And that was taped out in, in uh, Massachusetts or New Hampshire. And uh, we had a guy on the stage with that audio and when he stood up and he, he said, you know, it, uh, here's what you really did. Let's play this tape. Well, uh, that was uh, just about it for Kirkland because Donahue ran to the mic, shoved Lane out of the way and concluded the meeting. The next morning, Kirkland resigned. And then Donahue be, began to run for that position. So we played a key role because we challenged him all across the country with demonstrations and Q&A sessions that uh, didn't ask the right questions for them. Well, then uh, at the 95 convention, and you were there in New York, uh, Trump and, and Sweeney uh, met with, the, with our local leaders, and I was in the meetings and, uh, as the rank and file organizer, and they promised us unparalleled support. What do you guys need? And boy, did we give them a laundry list. Well, as it turns out, the whole time, and we challenged we challenged them down in Bell Harbor, Florida, prior to that convention, and disrupted their AFL-CIO meeting. How did you go? How did you end up in Bell Harbor, Florida? And you know, well, we what, knew what happened there. Well, we knew they were having an executive council meeting. You know, all the unions and stuff at a very plush hotel, and we decided that they were going to help us, whether they wanted to or not. So, uh, my local took a, a, and. The Caterpillar workers took a bus load and a, and a support van load of people to Bell Harbor, Florida. Now we had to, our guys had to stay in a flea bag motel. We couldn't afford their plush surroundings. So they showed up at the door with a big sign and Dr. Harry Kelber was there to, to help, uh, you know, grease the wheel and, and asking for their support and getting them to sign on to this support sheet that they would support our struggles. Uh, personally, uh, I was not there. If it had been up to me, we'd have kicked the damn door down and we, we'd have went in and got right in their face. But then I was told I was too militant. Uh, but uh, then after the, after the, uh, the convention and all their promises, it became clear that uh, that they were working against us. The old bureaucracy uh, had taken over the new guard. And what I mean is, is the, uh, the FLCIO leadership always go by what the folks that pay the per capita says, and that's the international union presidents and executives. And that uh, the paper workers was undermining our struggle basically telling the FLCIO to stay out of it. And, you know, we had done a lot of creative things across the country. And, you know, and, and, and like I said, I met with Rich a lot of time at, uh, you know, he, he said at one time that uh, I was the commanding general of the Road Warriors, which was our outreach people that went out and raised funds and support for our struggle. Then all of a sudden, I turned into that lion sack from Decatur, Illinois. And uh, they, they went to London with the FEIA leadership, Wayne Glenn, and uh, who I consider a traitor. And without our local leadership and without any input from the local, even though our constitution calls for it, and they negotiated a deal with taking lies in London behind our backs. And they came back and they forced a vote on the floor to the membership and worked against us uh, all, all that time. You know, we had a major rally scheduled for the East Coast at PepsiCo, who was Staley's uh, uh, number one customer for their syrup. And even that, they shot down, they sent a, they threatened the, the group, uh, the New Jersey CIO, uh, with legal action if they continued supporting us. That's how bad they wanted to shut us down. So that in the end, 
they sold us out and then they thought that was the end of it. Well, it wasn't because I'm always determined that if somebody does you wrong, you have to hold them accountable. And they did us wrong. And the effort to under to uh, expose what they did came in our final newsletter from the war zone. And then uh, we started at uh, U of I when Trump was invited to speak. And so was I, and boy, was that a mistake. Because I went and I spoke. And uh, we really put a turd in Trump's punch bowl as he tried in most of those people up there in that labor uh, arena in the, at the college, University of Illinois, they knew this daily struggle and they knew what they did. They wasn't buying the bullshit that they were putting out. So, uh, and then we reached out across the country through our supporters and we picketed Trump and Sweeney wherever we could. One of the incidents took place in Madison, Wisconsin. When C uh, Sweeney showed up to stump for a Democratic politician, you know, gag me with a spoon. Where were they when we needed them? But uh, they carried a big black coffin in front of the speaker stand and embarrassed uh, Sweeney, I think, and gave him his worst day. So he met with, uh, you know, some of the Decatur folks from all three unions and my wife, uh, who gave uh, Sweeney, I think, his worst day. And then after that, uh, we, we continued the pressure on them. And the local priest here in Decatur who has died, Father Martin Mangan, they, uh, they called him and wanted to fly him to Washington. Well, he called me and he, he asked me, he said, what do you think this is about, Mike? I said, well, I said, what they want you to do is to make me go away. He and all the guys that are out there exposing what they did and he knew what they did i mean he got it he said i'll talk to you when i get back so he came back and he says you were exactly right he said uh, he said they that's that's what they want they want you to go away i said uh, well i'm not it's not going to happen father Megan. he says whatever you're doing keep it up because it's working he says they are really getting stung by the pressure that you're putting on what they did. So a couple of, maybe a month or two later, Richard Trumka decides to fly to Decatur all by himself. He didn't even be, bring Big Rex, his uh, Neanderthal bodyguard that followed him around everywhere he went, you know, muscle it. And uh, no reporters, no news release or nothing. And we met at St. James Church and there was people from Caterpillar, Firestone, and the Staley Struggle, including my local president, Dave Watts. And uh, he, Dave was, uh, he was incredible throughout all of this. He had the courage to stand up to take and lies, and he had the courage to stand up to the International, which we picketed them twice down in Nashville. And uh, that uh, really uh, created a stir. So Trump flew back, and I think his mission was was to try to make us go away, to give us a reason why he couldn't do all the things that he promised. Well, I can tell you, Steve, a promise is a promise, and if I make you one, I'll die trying to keep it, especially when it comes to labor issues. So we had that meeting, and it wound up being about a four-hour screaming match in, in the rectory of that church. And Trump could, uh, Trump could just repeatedly saying the FLCIO cannot render assistance unless it is authorized or requested by the international union. So there you, there it is right there. Just what I told you, you know, they, they, the EPIA was working against this. And I knew that. And I had that conversation with Wayne Glenn when he came to Decatur after nearly three years uh, to our, our campaign office, which was where the organizers were. And uh, we exchanged some pretty sharp words. And uh, so anyway, I, I, I told Meng and I said, you know, I, I'm really sorry for using some of that language when we took a break. Uh, 
in in the meeting there with Trumpka, and uh, I said, in, you know, using that in the basement of your rectory, and he looked right square at my eye, and he took a drink of his scotch. He says, yeah, he says, and they're lying MFers too. <laughs> Only he said it. <laughs> but kind of shocked even me. But he never gave up trying to fight for the Staley workers. Never. He even got arrested, you know, and refused to pay the fine. He was what a what a labor leader should have been, but he was a priest. And he was even being threatened by the director of his archdiocese because he was stepping on the toes of big donors to the Catholic church, but he never gave up and we never gave up. So anyway, in the end, that's how the great Mr. Trumpka uh, showed his militancy and uh, his fighting for ordinary workers. Uh, apparently, if he was fighting for me, uh, he was just uh, uh, more or less slapping thin air. He sure wasn't throwing any punches against the corporate elite. And we're talking with Mike Griffin, uh, whose family is our miners, and uh, who was a one of the organizers and a campaign of the three unions uh, that were on strike: uh, Firestone, Caterpillar, and Tate Lyle. Mike, there's been a strike now of over five months of the miners in Alabama. And apparently, Trumpka sent a video message to them when they had a rally of a couple thousand workers there. But one of the things that you have worked for uh, as a union organizer is to link up your struggles and many struggles around the country and internationally through the rank and file, through locals and the mobilization of the rank and file. You think that they were afraid of that kind of organizing, that they saw that as a threat to their control of the apparatus? Oh, absolutely. Uh uh, the minute my name pops up in a local union uh, that uh, I'm assisting them or helping to educate them or raising money for them or, or uh, you know, su building support for them, the international immediately tries to get them to steer away from me because they, they know that we represent the real union, the one that fights for workers and fights for issues not the one that sells them out. Uh, since the Staley lockout ended, and uh, I have been involved in struggles all across the country and even out of the country. And I've, I've seen some real horror stories, Steve, that, uh, that just, it boggles the mind. And uh, you'll remember the split in the FLCIO when, uh, when the Carpenters Act, you know, and, and Sweeney's, as the guy that took over the SEIU joined forces with the employers and, and divided the FLCIO. And Andy Stern, but that's a Andy real Stern, testament yeah. to where this labor movement's at. It don't matter whether you admit that you're working with the employers or you do it behind the scenes. The fact is, is that they are. And you got to wonder with all the stuff that's been going on the last four and a half years, where in the hell has, is the AFL-CIO? Is it the AFL-CIA or the AFL-CIO? Uh, you know, because they're working hand in hand with government. They're not opposing any of this stuff that happened during, the, you know, Trumpenstein's years. They're not being vocal about any of the things that's going on. And, and they're not even standing up for the right to vote across the country. So what good is the AFL-CIO? Have they been silent? I mean, there's been no mass protest, no mobilization of the rank and file uh, by the AFL-CIO. Is that because they're in bed with uh, the Democratic Party and, and Biden and Absol company? Absolutely. They, and that's been their nemesis. When, when I was working uh, to, to help organize a labor party in this country, and along with a lot of folks around the country, uh, they desperately work to undermine our effort, you know, and the few uh, national leaders that was involved in it, for them, it was just a, an exercise to threaten the Democratic Party. They never had any intentions of carrying through organizing a, a workers party that 
actually represented the, the kings and queens of our societies, which is America's workers. They're the ones that create all the wealth. And by golly, we ought to have a say in how that wealth is distributed. And what did they do? I mean, the question of the Labor Party, uh, working people now are very angry about the political situation, the economic situation, the COVID, the fact they can't get the facts straight from the government. Um, the, yet the AFL-CIO seems to, and most unions, national unions, seems to believe that getting the Democrats elected will save labor. You don't believe that? No, oh, oh I, know that. I know it won't. I mean, what did Obama do for organized labor? He never even got us the right to join a union. I mean, he did nothing for labor except use their vote. And I, I, a lot of rank and file people got that message. That's why they voted for Trumpenstein. They saw this big, ugly, pink goon from a television show and bought all the BS. And look where it got us. It got us with a country that's so divided, it's going to take 40 years to overcome it. And the, the issue of uh, organizing, the, as I said, the miners have been on strike, his own union that he came from, uh, for over five months. There doesn't seem to be any national campaign. There's no effort to reach out to labor councils and unions around the country to build support for them. When there was the Amazon struggle around the, the, the vote for a union, there was no national campaign. In fact, there were rallies called by the Southern Workers' Assembly, which were not supported by the AFL. So in fact, it wasn't even on their website that there was going to be an election. Are they afraid of, of mobilizing the rank and file nationally? Uh, Absolutely. They can't control them, Steve. That's what that's their biggest fear. They're not afraid of the employers. They could just continue licking their boots and they get along just fine. But the mobilized rank and file scares the hell out of them. And can you imagine what a tremendous mistake uh, as far as organizing in the South was for them not to support the mine workers or the Amazon workers? Sends a powerful message to other workers in the South. Don't unionize. And you know, the UAW, you have a little experience with those uh, that union as well. Uh, there were a number of struggles in the South uh, that you were involved in. Why don't you talk about organizing in the South, your, uh, your experience with the UAW in the South, where they spent probably millions and millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars to organize in the South, but haven't been able to do that. Well, they, the, the UAW kept failing in the South because people saw through the veneer uh, of, of uh, union representation. Uh, you know, and what's really come to a head here recently is, is all the gross corruption in the UAW. But even more corrupt is the way that they have controlled their members, controlled their conventions, controlled the votes, and worked with the employers to defeat any employee group or local union that had the courage to stand up to the employers. I mean, it's it's almost like they're an anti-union union. I think and, they are. And this business union and unionism and concession bargaining uh, that exemplifies uh, for rank and file workers, the AFL-CIO and the top union bureaucracy, why do they believe that workers have to make concessions and give up and, and capitulate basically to the boss's demands? Well, they don't, they, don't, uh, they don't want a union that actually works. They can't control it. It's about controlling the members. They're only interested in maintaining their benefits, their wages, their dual retirements. You know, that's all that matters to them. And if they give more to the rank and file, <coughs> they have to fight for it. It may cost them some of their money. But here's another thing. If they actually went to work, and fought for a local union, then they'd have to answer to all the other unions why they didn't fight for them. I mean, it, it's, it, it's, uh, it's more or less, it's self-perpetuating. How can you fight for a local union when you've betrayed all the others? And you have the, the rise of uh, fascist movements, right-wingers, uh, uh, and Trump, uh, it incited people against immigrants, uh, against blacks, browns, Asians. Uh, did you, you think that Trump should have spoken out about these uh, 
uh, attacks of uh, uh, Trumpka rather should have spoken out of, uh, about these attacks on immigrants, on, on blacks, browns, Asians in this country. It seems like he was virtually silent. Well, they're pretty well silent on everything. What you have to do, Steve, is remember that the AFL-CIO might have top positions in it, the, the president and the secretary treasurer, you know, and staff members and regional officers and stuff. But basically, it's all run by a bunch of international unions that pays per capita to them. And they're the ones that really calls the shots. So the FLCIO is not going to move right or left unless it's okayed by a bunch of bureaucratic jackasses. And that's what they are, all of them. There's not one of them that is fit to lick the boots of a guy working on the factory floor. And this, uh, uh, the, they shut down the education department, the AFL-CIO. Why would they shut down the education department when the issue of knowledge of labor, labor history, you would think would be critical for working people in this country? Uh, I, well, it probably it might have had to do something with cost savings because they've lost so many members. But you're right that the education department was extremely important. And that's actually the lifeblood to the future of organized labor is educating workers. And, uh, you know, doing stupid things uh, is not something they're unaccustomed to. And the future of labor, it seems that uh, the, the, they're, they're more and more angry workers about what's happening to them economically, the whole COVID, uh, how workers are put into places that are contaminated. Uh, they're getting COVID and, and companies like uh, uh, Amazon and others don't give a damn really whether workers live or die as long as they get their profits. You think the whole system now you're saying is threatened with collapse. I mean, because of this uh, craziness of profiteering and, and capitalism, basically. You know, you would think that uh, uh, when it came time for vaccinations and wearing masks and and uh, following protocols and stuff like that, that the AFL-CIO through their regional offices would have had people going out even to factory floors and supporting those protocols to try to get this thing under control. Unless you control this, this, uh, this COVID, you know, you have no control over the economy because it's controlling the economy. And then you have people who are super stupid, like Governor Abbott, you know, he's nothing but an asshole in a wheelchair. And then you got guys like DeSantis, who's a political criminal, both of them. There's no question in my mind, the governor of Missouri, you name it, they're all contributing to the number of deaths that's taking place according to COVID. With the policies that they're following, and some of the stupid things they're doing, such as not allowing mask mandates in schools, things like that. The FLCIO should be on their high horse going after this. One thing is, if you look at DeSantis in Florida, and he's tough to look at because it's just he's just a walking horse's ass, you know, for him to, to put out that mandate and then try to force these uh people want to send their kids to school to take up the voucher system and underfund public education to go to privatized schools. That hurts organized labor. Well, it seems Where's like, Randy Weingarten at? Yeah, well, that, that's a good question. With privatization and vouchers, it seems like the, uh, the billionaires want to use uh, this crisis, the COVID crisis, to privatize the entire public education system. In this and country. that's exactly part of their plan. DeSantis has got it all figured out. He's pretty sharp. This is, a, this is the Edison project all over again. And I, I remember battling that here in Decatur years ago, and we won. We, we got them taken off the, off the radar. And Champaign, yeah. Illinois. Well, you have these billionaires, and uh, don't you have Warren Buffett's son involved in Decatur, Illinois? What, what's happening? Yeah, but now? guess who he works for? He, he worked for ADM. <coughs> so Warren Buffett's son uh, had a place in, in Decatur, Illinois. Why did he want to become sheriff 
And what was that all about? He was working for ADM and he wanted to be sheriff. I mean, you think a billionaire's son would not be interested in being sheriff you, in Peter, Illinois. You should see what the, the tens of millions that he spent building up a law enforcement training center. I mean, millions, uh, millions of dollars refurbishing an old place, you know, and in wor working as the acting sheriff. Then he ran for sheriff and decided not to. But everything that he's doing is paving a way for the, the uh, police society. That's their agenda, more police. Absolutely. And Why not? The, if, they, if they can't change their minds, hell, they'll just shoot us. And one of the big things that the AFL-CIO push, uh, pushed for, they pushed for EFCA under Obama. They didn't get it. And now the PRO Act. Now, the AFL-CIO thinks you're going to get this by sending letters to Congress. Do they actually believe that sending an email to, to a congressman is going to get the PRO Act, Mike? Well, to be honest with you, Steve, I'm surprised most of them can write. <laughs> They're not real good thinkers. First of all, you have to care, Steve. You have to give a darn about working people. And they don't. They've turned, it, they've turned the labor movement upside down. And uh, the, the issue of... Uh labor organizing. How do you think Amazon and these big companies are going to be organized? You think it's going to be by, by legislation or by mass mobilization of workers? I mean, the, the 30s and 40s, it wasn't through the legislation that they came. It was mainly through workers jamming general strikes, occupying factories, a mass mobilization, which uh, I think they're terrified about because we had the example of David Van Dusen and the Vermont AFL-CIO saying there should be a general strike against an attempted coup in the United States, an insurrection. And uh, Trump uh, attacked them and actually had an investigation and threatened to put them into trusteeship. Uh, well, I think, I think he was right. He's exactly on the money. If you want to get to people like uh, Jeff Bezos, get to the money. And you do that by mobilizing a mass strike and shutting down his facilities. Has to cost him a lot of money. Then you have to have Democrats, real Democrats, and there's only two or three. <laughs> and, and I mean, Elizabeth Warren, maybe and Bernie Sanders. Uh, you have to have a, a Democratic Party that really stands for labor. And this right here, the Democratic Party today is nothing but the bosses of their party. That's all they've been for generations. Look at all the times that they've had control of the White House and the Congress, and they did nothing for ordinary ordinary working people, nothing, and nothing for organizing unions. Well, they've spent the uh, AFL-CIO, uh, SEIU, uh, Carpenters, most of the unions, uh, UAW, they spent hundreds of millions, probably billions over the years supporting these Democrats. Uh, your struggle, uh, Decatur, Illinois, the miners, you think that millions of dollars would be going to these unions who are in struggle? You got you to gotta remember, though, that, that uh, if they really did their job right, they would actually have to lead. And, and it's a lot easier to follow, you know, and, and let the Democrats lead the way. But none of them are going to do what it takes to rebuild this labor movement. We got to start over somewhere. Okay, well, I want to thank you very much for joining us uh, on Work Week. We've been talking with Mike Griffin, longtime organizer, fighter for the working class and the labor movement. So thanks for joining us, Mike. Well, thank you, Steve.